I've been asked to talk a bit about my journey from council to parliament, and I have to say, in many ways, this journey has been quite a roller coaster. Um, this time last year, I was on Adelaide City Council, and um, certainly would not have predicted that this time this year I'd be in the, the federal Senate. So it's been a, a fairly crazy um, 12 months, but a very rewarding time for me. Um, I came to be in the Senate by way of a casual vacancy. Penny Wright, the Green Senator for South Australia, resigned for uh, family reasons, and I was elected by the membership of the Greens to replace her in the Senate, was endorsed by the, the State Parliament. So that's how I had the opportunity to um, step into this role. And, you know, it certainly is a, an honour to be able to represent the people of South Australia in the Parliament, but also, as a gay man, an honour to be able to um, represent uh, LGBTI people, or at least do my best to, to do so by raising some of the issues that face our community. One of the things that has um, always inspired me as a political activist is the power of politics to change lives for the better, to directly impact on people's lives. And council is the level of government that does that really well. The work that councils do really impact on people's lives in a very tangible and direct way. And you only have to talk to someone about the impact of noise on their street or the impact of a development in their local area to know that council rules and regulations really do have a significant impact. I ran for City Council in 2014 and it was a, a time of significant transition in the City of Adelaide. Anyone who's been to Adelaide will know that it's a beautiful city. I happen to think the best city in the country, but I'm probably a little bit biased. <laughs> I'll call to make over here in Melbourne, I know. Um, but Adelaide is uh, definitely a city that is at a crossroads. You know, traditionally, Adelaide had a reputation as being the city of churches. When I was um, at school, the idea of a big night in Adelaide was a marathon for Bill. So things have certainly changed. Uh, things have certainly changed a bit since then. Um, and in 2010, we saw the election of a progressive Lord Mayor, and we saw the council working very closely with the government to try and activate the CBD in a way that we hadn't seen before. And so. I wanted to run for council so that I could contribute to that momentum and try and contribute to that change happening in the city. And if anyone's been to Adelaide recently, I think you would agree there has been a change in, um, in our city in, um, in recent years. Inter interestingly, in South Australia, we don't run under party banners in local council. I know here in Victoria, you do run as uh, party badged candidates. That's not the case in South Australia. So. I didn't run as a, um, an open Green, but I had run before as a candidate for the Greens in the state elections, and um, the areas where I got most of my support geographically were actually strong areas for the Greens, so I think it was clear that I was going to be pursuing a, a Green agenda. My main platform when I ran for council was around city greening and modernisation, but I also focused on inclusion and wanting to provide some leadership on council around LGBTI uh, rights and, and issues and that was an interesting point down the track when I did raise uh, issues affecting the LGBTI community I was accused of bringing this kind of radical agenda to the council table um, contrary to my election but of course I did campaign on those issues um, Adelaide Council, just for those of you who might be interested in the way our council operates, we have four area councillors that represent the city as a whole and seven ward councillors who represent different geographical areas. And I ran for an area councillor because I wanted to address some of the broader strategic issues within the council. And once I was elected, I pursued a range of different policies, things like green roofs and walls. I did some work on issues around city homelessness and um, divestment of fossil fuels. But the most contentious and controversial issue I promoted was the Rainbow Walk in the CBD. And last year was the 40th anniversary of the decriminalisation of homosexuality in South Australia. And I thought it would be good for Council to do something to recognise that as an important milestone in our city. And Adelaide does has a reputation as being a, a city of firsts, and South Australia 
of course, has been the leader in social change in Australia. So I thought as the capital city of our state, we should do something positive to celebrate that story. The only um, a monument we have in um, the city of Adelaide that represents the LGBTI community is um, a memorial for Dr. George Duncan, who was drowned in the Torrens over 40 years ago. And so I thought it was important to have something that also celebrated the, the advances that have been made since then. And I thought a rainbow crossing could be one idea worthy of consideration. So council agreed to investigate some options and the idea was well received at the time. Um, but of course then I started to face some roadblocks in terms of getting it off the ground. The first of those came from the council administration that said that we would need special permission from the state government because it was some radical change to traffic regulations. The state government didn't want to do it because of um, safety concerns and they cited what had happened in Sydney as an example of what can go terribly wrong with these um, rainbows in the, in the CBD. And so I thought, right, I'm going to try and work around that and I'll offer a rainbow walk instead. That way it won't be uh, disturbing traffic signals and we can have the actual focus on the project. So worked with representatives from the LGBTI community. We found a potential site and it took some time for this proposal to be eventually presented to council. Uh, but when that happened, that's when we saw a huge amount of controversy and the religious right in um, Adelaide really organised around this issue. We saw some organisation of the uh, religious right in South Australia at local government level happen um, in relation to the uh, raising of rainbow flags. We've got a gay and lesbian festival in Adelaide called the Feast Festival. It happens in November of every year. And a number of councils during that time often raise the rainbow flag as a, a symbol of solidarity. And we saw um, the religious right and, and these hardline conservative organisations, letterboxing, hate mail, and really even going into shopping centres, handing out flyers, getting really active on um, the idea that councils were showing leadership in, in this issue. Um, in Adelaide, they began bombarding uh, myself and other councillors with hate mail. I have to say, in my new role, I do receive um, a bit of that, but um, this was certainly uh, at a different level of the kind of stuff that was being um, levelled, really warning us that all hell would break loose if we went ahead with this radical proposal. We had um, deputations from conservative organisations suggesting that if the project went ahead, it would pose a safety risk to children. Um, my favourite was the suggestion from um, one particular organisation that said that small children would be so drawn to the rainbow that they would run along the footpath into the traffic. Um, and obviously this would be a terrible hazard. So it couldn't possibly go ahead. Um, we also had suggestions that the project was unfair to other groups because if we had this rainbow walk, we would have to have them for other organisations, other groups in the community. And uh, one person put in a deputation that the LGBTI community had actually done nothing to deserve this symbol. Why wasn't council talking about rates, roads and rubbish? Now, in the end, um, council did commit to the project. I have to pay a tribute to my former council colleagues for doing that. One of my favourite moments in the debate was when one of the more conservative councillors stood up and said, oh, you know, I wasn't really in support of this project. I thought it was a bit of a waste of money. But then I started receiving these horrible emails and you've convinced me it really was needed. So the, the Christian right did a great job um, in pushing conservative councillors over the line and um, we got the project. But it still needs to be rolled out and I'm keeping a close, a close eye on that. Um, I think one of the things that I found really frustrating about the way that that debate was framed was this idea that this isn't business for council. And, you know, Adelaide City Council had spent $200,000 on Christmas decorations the year before, yet somehow the idea of spending a small amount of money to paint a strip of road in the CPD was, you know, a bridge too far. Um, you know, I made the point at the time it was a bit like Hadrian's Wall. It's taking a long time to, you know, go ahead and do it. But there was certainly a consistent theme running through the uh, opposition to the Rainbow Wall project. The idea it's not poor business, but also the idea that the LGBTI community aren't legitimate or worthy of recognition, that these aren't key priorities for government. And reflecting on my journey from council to the Senate, I'd say that's certainly been a theme that runs through our national politics as well in terms of 
the way that issues of LGBTI rights are dealt with. And if we consider, for instance, the debate around marriage equality, Rodney touched on that before, it's clear there's been this argument run over many years that this shouldn't be a priority for government. There seems to be this misconception that if we legislate for marriage equality, that will prevent the government from doing other essential things like handing down a budget. You know, I've heard this line said, we're focused on the economy, we're not focused on these other issues like marriage equality. Well, the great thing about a democracy like ours, of course, is that we can do both. And how can the recognition of love be a second order issue? And surely we can deal with that with the other priorities of government. Parliament deals with a diverse range of issues simultaneously. That's the nature of a parliamentary democracy. But the fact that this particular issue has been singled out and been made so unduly complex is really a testament to just how far opponents of marriage equality will go in their efforts to try and wreck this reform. The latest roadblock, of course, is this idea of a national plebiscite on marriage equality, the brainchild of Tony Abbott that's now been taken up by Malcolm Turnbull. And apparently the rights of LGBTI people are some kind of secondary consideration that can be sacrificed at the altar of public opinion. Well, we've never seen plebiscites used as a way of resolving fundamental questions of human rights in our country. And it does set an alarming precedent for our democracy, but it also reveals something about the way that LGBTI issues and rights are dealt with. And I think more broadly, we're seeing an unhealthy movement in our democracy at the moment that elevates the freedom of speech above all other human rights. In fact, we've even seen the Attorney General defend the right to be a bigot. Well, what about the right to feel safe, to feel protected from vilification and persecution? The appalling attacks on the Safe Schools program are evidence of this. We saw, uh, quite frankly, offensive and deplorable comments from uh, backbench MPs in the government uh, being given free air, and you know the uh, Prime Minister certainly didn't reprimand these members of Parliament for their comments. These, uh, the, the right for them to express their view was uh, elevated before the rights of LGBTI young people and, and their welfare, and I think that's a reprehensible thing. Because rather than staring down these bullies, the government has chosen to placate them. So the right to free speech in a democracy like ours needs to be balanced against the rights of others to feel free from persecution, from vilification. And that kind of balance is fundamental to a liberal democracy like Australia. Another issue I confronted as a gay man, both on council and now in the Senate is the way in which I talk about my own story and my own identity. When I was elected to council, I made the decision that I would talk openly about being gay. Um, it earned me the tag of being the openly gay councillor. It was quite amusing to see in virtually every news story was referenced to me as openly gay councillor, Robert Sims says. Um, it was amazing the, the way in which that was worked into virtually every media story. Um, and as a, a senator, I decided to talk about that as well. And indeed, in my first speech in the Senate, I talked a bit about my experience coming out and, and how that was a difficult journey for me. And a lot of friends, uh, both straight and gay, have often asked me whether I'm concerned about being typecast. And I'm sure that would be an issue for um, those of you who are also involved with LGBTI activism and are talking about these issues. And friends have said, oh, surely you don't like being defined by your sexuality and, you know, aren't you, um, aren't you typecasting yourself? Well, fundamentally, I believe that one of the best ways to combat homophobia and um, prejudice is visibility. I think that one of the best tools we have in the LGBTI community is pride and visibility. And the very act of talking about differences in sexuality and gender identity challenges heteronormative assumptions and it can break down prejudice. And indeed that's been one of the huge factors in social change in this country. It's been people talking about their personal stories and as Rodney said, that's a big way, um, a big strategy that we can use to, to win the fight for marriage equality. And so as a result of this visibility, we've seen sexuality become less taboo and we've seen the emergence of more fluid uh, approaches to sexuality and gender identity and I think that's a really good thing. I also think it's a powerful thing for people who are undergoing their own journey with sexuality and gender identity. 
because of course you can't be what you can't see. And certainly for me as a, a young man growing up, I often struggled to find role models I could relate to and all of the, the representations uh, in um, contemporary culture at that time I, I found difficult to relate to. I didn't see any gay role models. And so I've always thought it is important, whatever field of work you're in, to be upfront and talk about your, your sexuality. And uh, in doing so, we can break down barriers. That's certainly something I've, I've tried to do in my role. I guess I want to conclude by impressing on you the importance of addressing LGBTI rights across any level of government. Building more inclusive communities is fundamental to creating happier and healthier places to live. And council is uniquely placed to show leadership on these kind of issues. You know, of course, we know that the remit of council is much broader than rates roads and rubbish. It's about so much more than that. It's about creating the kind of city and the kind of community that people want to live in. And you can't do that unless you're inclusive of LGBTI people and provide a, an opportunity to talk about their lived experiences. So through diversity and elected members, but also through appropriate policy frameworks and positive symbols, these are the kind of things that can make a really tangible difference at a local level. And they also strengthen the arm of advocates at a state and federal level too in terms of advocating against discrimination within our law. So council can have a big impact in that regard and uh, I do encourage you to, to make the most of that potential. Thank you.